In a short while, the Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Defense will deliver a much anticipated report to the US Senate Intelligence Committee. It is hoped by many the contents of that report will reveal some of what the Pentagon knows about UAPs or unidentified aerial phenomena. Today's guest, Paul Dean, a renowned ufologist with decades of research under his belt, will join us to talk about what might be in that report. We'll also discuss the United States Air Force's conspicuous silence and where Australia lies in collecting data into UAPs. I'm Brett Moffat, and you're listening to the UFOs of Oz podcast. Today our guest is Paul Dean, a renowned Australian researcher who focuses on government and military involvement and response to the UFO phenomena. Paul has been instrumental in seeing that the Australian government release hitherto classified files from the Royal Australian Air Force, Air Services Australia, the Australian Transport Safety Bureau and the National Archives of Australia. Today we'll be discussing the forthcoming Pentagon report on unidentified aerial phenomena or UAPs or UFOs in the vernacular. It's expected to be delivered to Congress later this month, sometime between the 25th and 29th of June. Thanks so much for joining me, Paul. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, I'd like to briefly discuss for our audience why this report was requested, by whom and who's preparing it. So in 2020, the US Senate Intelligence Committee called for an inquiry into UAPs in the Intelligence Authorization Act for the fiscal year 2021. According to the document, committee members were concerned, and I quote, that there is no unified comprehensive process within the federal government for collecting and analyzing intelligence on unidentified aerial phenomena, despite the potential threat, end quote. On December 27th, 2020, the bill was enacted when then President Donald Trump signed a $2.3 trillion COVID-19 relief bill that also required the Pentagon to continue investigating UAPs and release its findings to the public. The Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Defence then had 180 days to produce a report for the committee submitted in unclassified form on the current status of UAP sightings and protocols. We are now closing in on that deadline. The report has instigated a lot of excitement in UFO circles and consequently in the media, with many enthusiasts demanding disclosure from the US government. But is that demand realistic? And if not, then why? So Paul, what do you think we can expect from this report? Well, um, basically, yeah, going back, what's happened is is that um, in, in August 2020, um, the uh, the Deputy uh, Secretary of Defence, who was uh, David Norquist at the time, uh, he he uh, authorised a um, he authorised the the forming of a task force, a, like a, an unidentified aerial phenomena, or we'll, we'll say UFO task force, um, that was to be headed and ran by the Department of Defence, which I'll get into later, um, and, 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 the, and that, and that uh, task force was to study, analyse, make conclusions about, you know, generate information, uh, filter information about re like recorded and reported UFO sightings or UFO uh, detections, radar systems, radiation meters, that sort of thing, um, within within say the continental United States or certainly around the United States, um, and and it, that 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 task force was to be headed up by the Office of Naval Intelligence, which is a major uh, it, it's a major body within the Department of the Navy, um, and and so. Fast forward to December. Um, Congress has Congress has asked for a report, um, could be partially classified, um, or certainly, uh, if it's unclassified, it will have a cla like classified appendixes and annexes at the end. 
uh, the, the you know we're not allowed to say, and uh, that that the will be presented to Congress through the uh, Senate Select uh, Committee on Intelligence. Okay, and that 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 date is is due due now. So as far as the actual report goes, you think about it like this: uh, let's say you've got a task force within the Office of Naval Intelligence that's been studying UFO cases. Some of those UFO cases will be very contemporary, recently reported by pilots or seamen or, or, or navigators or, or, or possibly you know, transport pilots or, or, or radar technicians, radar operators at squadron level on, on, on military bases, battalion commanders, um, maybe engineers, government engineers, whatever, whatever, whoever's reporting UFO, maybe even government astronomers. Um, so they've been studying those for months. Um, that task force, we don't know who it's made up of. We don't know if they're astrodynamicists or flight dynamicists or astronomers or uh, physicists or electrical engineers or, or, or photographic information uh, experts or optical physicists. We just don't know. Uh, we know that uh, the task force typically, like it could, it could have, say, four people, five people, um, and now they've got to, they, now they will have written their report. They will have written like a, a, a contemporary, possibly somewhat pre preliminary uh, report for, for, for Congress and for um, various subcommittees on intelligence and astronautics and aerial threats and, and, and maybe even nuclear strategy or, or foreign diplomacy or, or, or atmospheric physics and whatever, whoever's essentially interested, you know, not to mention the media. Now, that report's due really soon and it could actually drop any moment just because there's a deadline of 180 days since the 27th of december last year doesn't mean that it, it necessarily has to be on the 100 you know 80 day mark it, it could come out slightly earlier um and as far as what's in it well that's a big question but judging by past um reports i'm going right back to the 40s here such as um the preliminary findings of Project Sign in 1947, or the uh, you know a, a, the various status reports of Project Blue Book from um, from uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base in the 50s through to um, the O'Brien Commission or the O'Brien Panel, I should say, um, in the 60s. I think that the report will detail first uh, its purposes. It's essentially a preamble. Um, it will. It, it, it document or, or maybe list or log the the sort of um, specialties of the, the the authors and the investigators or the, like the UFO sighting investigators actually have. So, you know, their their rank, their their particular specialties, whether that be astronomy or planetary physics or whatever. Then we'll probably get into methodology, and this is where things get really important. So. What sort of cases did they filter out? Did did they filter out UFO sightings if there was just one witness? You know, uh, the astronomer Joseph Allen Hynek famously said a single witness case, like where there's just one witness to a UFO or one witness really to anything, um, is no case at all, right? It's just not reliable enough. And, I mean, will they, will they have a methodology that filters out single witness cases? Maybe they'll have a methodology where they, they only study cases or certainly only cases got into this report that were where ufos were spotted or detected say above a certain altitude you know a thousand feet ten thousand feet whatever mm. maybe they only studied cases that where there was photographic evidence or maybe they haven't had a rule where 25 percent of the cases they studied had to be photographs and 25 percent had to be moving footage like film or video footage and 25 percent had to be radar detections mm. um and so on that's the sort of thing that will be in that, that that's the sort of thing that could be in in the report, then I, I would hope that they will have some statistics, you know, percentage of cases that they were able to solve, percentage of cases that they were not able to solve, um, and, and breakdowns of where those cases came from geographically, um, and, and where those cases came from as far as which service, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, uh, the Canadian Air Force, through embassies from other countries, that sort of thing, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, what it, that's what it should have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and um, it would it would seem that the the air force is conspicuous by its absence, but is that is that just a, a like a, a perception? Um, you know, is is that perception fair, or is or is it fair to say that they would be as as involved in this as as any of the other agencies? 
Now, this is the thing that really, this is this is what really troubles me and uh, a, a great, great many um, UFO historians and, and, and various investigators. The Air Force has been so silent. You know, the the, the, the Air Force, the Air, w- w- seasoned ufologists, seasoned UFO researchers, aerospace historians and so on, have all come to the agreement, or mostly come to the agreement, that the United States, this is from an American perspective, and it does apply to Australia and, and, and Great Britain and Canada and Mexico and whatever. But the, 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 in this case, the United States Air Force has been has, has, has appeared not to in any way lead the way. They have not appeared to offer resources. So the use of, say, the National Air and Space Intelligence Centre at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base or, say, the, the public admission that, that, you know, radar data, primary radar data is accessible like over long periods of time, you know, like uh, radar data has has is, is sitting there on hard drives held by the Air Force for years and years and years on end, and and the the Air Force should be normally one would think from a common sense point of view and a historical point of view that that, that the Air Force being the, what they actually are they control airspace they control air sovereignty they monitor uh, flight lanes they they have uh, the, usually the best combat pilots, the best eyes and ears in space. They partly operate uh, space surveillance satellites and so on. You would think that they would be leading the way, but they've been very uh, conspicuous in their absence, and we hope that they have been, you know, behind the scenes, we hope that the Air Force and and also an organisation called the North American Aerospace Defence Command, that's NORAD, we hope that the Air Force and NORAD have been uh, aiding the situation, providing data, providing expertise in solving cases, uh, pro- providing maybe bullet, bullet point inputs, um, that sort of thing. It, it's very strange. It's almost like one one ufologist uh, researcher who I know um, in California um, has said that it's almost like, and, and he's been doing this for 40 years, uh, he's, he's an excellent historian he said it's almost like the navy has completely bypassed and sidestepped right around the air force to their horror and there's nothing they can do about it the air force we do know historically the air force and norad would be happy to completely keep this under wraps it's embarrassing for them Mm. um it's 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 costly from a public relations point of view it's uh it, it delves into areas of national security i mean if you've got I mean, the Air Force would love nothing more for its pilots to, to be silent on UFO sightings, or sightings of anything for that matter, submarines in the water underneath them, mm. or, uh, you know, Russian bombers, etc. Of course, of course, pilots are supposed to be silent, you know. Mm. Um, and, and, but the Air Force has been very, uh, very, very closed on this. And mm. um, we, 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 that's what I'm actually almost most curious about, to be honest. Yeah, because um, I've, heard, um, I, I've, I've heard some pundits um, suggest that the Air Force um, is is potentially somewhat embarrassed because there are objects entering the airspace. They don't know what they are, nor can they kind of control the airspace, control basically the, the battlefield, so to speak. Um, and that's, um, that's kind of highly embarrassing and, and probably very difficult to talk about. Um, it, it's also, um, you know, probably in that... It, could potentially sit in that field of is is there a cover up? Is there stuff that they they actually don't want to um, disclose, and and this actually suits them because they can sort of um, continue on their their merry way and and keep um, the data to themselves, I suppose. Yeah, and this is this is what's troubling us. I one of my areas of expertise is working out is is being spent all these years working out. Uh, like where potentially UFO, and that is just unidentified flying object, um, uh, data could be kept and, and how it is reported and how it's physically actually stored. And and it's it, it's taken, you know, 10 years, but it is astounding how many avenues the United States Air Force, uh, that's including Air Force Space Command, Air Combat Command, the various branches, because the United States Air Force is enormous. Mm. It's got various branches, you know, Transport Command, it's got... Uh, the the, um, the Air Force Space Command, which controls a variety of space wings and squadrons, um, and the, the the I can tell you right now that, that I mean there is I know of at least you know ten ways that the United States Air Force actually record like detects 
objects. They could be missile bodies through to hijacked airliners if that happens, drug runners, um, asteroids coming to Earth's atmosphere, asteroids that are bypassing Earth, etc. Mm. We know of so many examples, the actual reporting systems by name and code and office symbol and so on. We know that, you know, for instance, there's the um, space-based infrared uh, satellite system mm. that records uh, heat signatures. That it, it look, the, 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 there's, there's a bunch of satellites run by the 30th Space Wing and the 50th Space Wing at um, Buckley Air Force Base and Peterson Air Force Base, Colorado and so on, that actually look down on Earth and they're looking for very, very intense heat signatures mm. of nuclear missiles. And mm. occasionally they pick up forest fires and oil well fires and so on. But we also know they pick up uh, anomalous objects and they're actually they've got a name they're actually called fast walkers mm. and i mean this is actually in documentation like like this is actually in um uh, air force documentation there's a few references to mm. fast walkers we know where fast walker data is kept it, it's kept at buckley air force base and i think backup copies are kept at vandenberg air force base at the uh, joint um at the joint functional component center for space um and 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 I mean that data alone would be fantastic. I mean that data would show that that if, if we could just get one incident where um, where where a, a, an Air Force satellite had picked up an intense heat signature above Earth's atmosphere, mm. doing loop de loops, or or say dipping into Earth's atmosphere and coming back out again, or something of that that ilk, yep. um, then that alone would be far better than any sighting by you know someone on the ground or some vague sighting from 20 years ago whatever the, the, mm. this is real hard data mm. and and the air force there's piles of examples like that's just one example there is many many examples i mean there's even an entire system there's actually an entire system for united states air force base personnel that's base executive officers um security personnel on the edge of air force installations etc there's, there's, there's actually a system for for base personnel to report ufos directly right up the chain of command to the national um military command center under the joint chiefs of staff in washington dc it's called the oprep 3 uh serious incident serious event report uh, channel basically it's like a classified fax machine mm. and, and it's used for reporting miscellaneous events and we know it's been used to report ufos directly literally from bases far flung bases on the on the on the border of canada and just off the coast of you know Florida and so on, and uh, it, the Oprep Three network has been used to to report uh, UFOs hovering over bases, UFOs um, dodging around incoming planes that are trying to land. Uh, and, and again, this is another system that the Air Force has has we hope would be coughing up data to this task force, whether they do or not, yet to be seen. Absolutely, and I think too because of the 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 propensity i guess the the number of ufo sightings that have been um reported on around um nuclear missile silos um nuclear power stations I've, i just find it so hard to believe that that the the sort of in terms of the you know the military reports um only coming out of the u.s navy you know based on their carrier groups doing workups um and and um Ryan Grave, the United States, um, former United States Navy pilot, saying that he would see these things every day um, on, on, you know, when they were doing patrols and, and whatnot. I just find it extremely hard to believe that the, the Uf, US Air Force um, wouldn't have very similar um, information and data. Um, and more of it. Yeah, it's potentially, that in theory, common sense would tell you that they've got even more of it. I mean, we know, we know for a fact, I mean, we know that I mean, even the army, even the army have have on their most sensitive bases, such as uh, the Strategic Missile Defense Command at, um, in Huntsville, Alabama, um, or yeah, uh, the um, the army uh, uh, missile test range out in the, I can't pronounce it, but it's some it, it, you pronounce it uh, sort of like Quajillian uh, Atoll. Mm. It's it's right out near American Samoa. Mm. Um, they they have a system called SIR Serious Incident Report. Which is used to re which can be used to report UFOs. Um, like I said before, the Air Force for uh, the installations like bases, nuclear bases, have the OPREP three um, serious incident, serious event reporting channel. The uh, Navy have the OPREP three uh, Navy Blue flag word 
channel. The um, the US Marine Corps also use a. It, it's called the US Marine Corps, I believe, use something called. I can't find much on it, but I'm, anecdotally, it's called the uh, the uh, Daily Spot Intelligence Reporting Channel um, to report a non critical UFO sightings um, around US Marine Corps. Bases. And a lot of these have nuclear weapons. I mean, mm. either there's nuclear, like Air Force nuclear bombers with actual nuclear weapons, or at least dummy nuclear weapons, or training nuclear weapons are landing at these sort of bases and taking off. Mm. Some of them, such as uh, Kirkland Air Force Base in um, New Mexico, uh, have uh, they store mothballed and, and what we call warm alert nuclear bombs that that would be maybe used in in a protract, like a protracted World War Three situation. Mm. Um, well, the Manzano Weapons Facility, which is right next to Kirtland, has ex- experienced some really quite intense UFO uh, activity, and it's and, and really quite detailed reports in the eighties uh, came out, and um, we know uh, like it, it's amazing to me that. The, this topic has taken this long. Um, this nuclear weapons uh, UFO sort of connection has been going on since, well, 1946. No, 1945. 1945, Hanford uh, Atomic Research Facility, which was a nat- national level laboratory in um, in Washington, um, and uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which was a uranium processing and reprocessing and, and research facility in, in, obviously, Tennessee. They've been uh, recording... Uh, intense close-up UFO sightings since 1944-45. Mm. And it, it's just been buried or ignored or classified or swept under the carpet. Um, colonels who are running the bases, colonels who are one, running battalions or wings or squadrons, you know, they've got a tour of duty, they've got men to look after, and if they can pass the buck and pass it on to someone else, mm. uh, especially if the sighting um, doesn't uh, stir up too many feathers in Washington, D.C., then ruffle so many feathers. Then, then they're prepared. They've been they've been able for this long to uh, to to make it a secondary issue. Mm. Yeah, mm. not good. No. Um, do, do you think, like, based on based on the things we've been discussing, um, do you feel as though the bureaucracy, like the bureaucracy of, I guess the 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 um, the military complex, I suppose, is is a leviathan. Um, it's it's so siloed and it's so massive. Do you feel as though it's it's because it's I guess so big, it it kind of it it can't get out of its own way, um, and, and that's why a lot of this information. It's not so much that um, it, it's un, unwilling to be disclosed. It's just the fact that um, it is so siloed that that um, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. Absolutely. Um, there's, there's, there's no doubt that the US, the, the United States military and the intelligence community is, is, is absolutely huge. And, you know, the, 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 there, is, there is multiple examples I can certainly give easily with the UFO phenomena where, where there is entire streams of information, like before I was talking about, um, uh, like, in space or space-based detection of, of infrared heat signatures you know that's run by the 30th and i think the 50th space wing um they will have virtually no sort of uh sort of like day-to-day or even ongoing or long-term dealings with say um you know a, a, a particular say um transport and logistics command within the united states marine corps so there's there's which also might be saying ufos there's there has been there has been a, a consistent um, lack of inter, what we call interoperability or interagency, interoperability or intra-agency uh, communication on this issue, and it's not getting any better. The, 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 there's, there's no doubt that the, the, the compartmentalisation hasn't helped at all. Mm. You know, it's almost like a, a very, very small military, like, say, New Zealand, somewhere like that, would probably be able to... Uh, Cognizise and and centralise a UFO reporting desk, or a, a certainly a scientific effort, a, a, a much quicker and and with much more efficiency than what could be done in the country like the United States. Mm. I reckon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, same here. Um, look, just a, a a change of tack now. So, um, if if we put the lens on the um, the Australian context, how would you perceive the Australian federal government? Um, our various defence and science agencies um, would review, would 
look at this report. Do you think they'll be likely to follow suit or be content to ride on the coattails of our United States friends? Or do any of our federal agencies already conduct similar kinds of research? Now, this is an interesting question. I would suspect, from what we know, that uh, I'll, I'll answer the second part first. Okay, there is a history. There is a. I'll go back. Um, I'll go back twenty five years. There is, or, or a bit longer. There, there is a history of a few organisations within the Australian government, top level, top echelon organisations, that are that are like from a scientific and technical defence angle. Um, there's a few organisations which which have or, or who have had personnel or, or, or various power brokers within them, various staff, um, deputy directors of, of, of boards and committees and so on, who have dipped in and out of the UFO matter. And they've essentially come away um, with more questions than... than they, they, it's hard when they've got no funding and, no, and little time, but those organisations are in the past... In, the, in recent memory, in our lifetimes, I mean, mm. have been um, the the old, well, in the 70s, it was called the Joint Intelligence Organisation, and now it's known as the Defence Intelligence Organisation. And the traditionally, the, the, the Joint Intelligence Organisation and now the Defence Intelligence Organisation has been made up of around about 10 directorates, like, you know, Directorate of International Affairs, Directorate of Foreign Weapons Purchases, Directorate of Economic Threats, Directorate of um, Nuclear Matters, Directorate of Science and Technology. Well, within the Directorate of Science and Technology, within the old JIO and current DIO, there has been some, I wouldn't say a lot, but there has been some proven and documented interest in UFOs. That is the analysis of sighting reports, that is the development of policy for um, anyone who comes asking, like ministers, the prime minister, etc. Uh, correspondence with um, allies through embassies and air attaches, um, and 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 if if there was if there was any organisation that was currently studying or or, or, or making conclusions about or, or developing some sort of plan and policy about UFOs, the DIO, the current DIO, particularly within the Directorate of Science and Technology would be, or, or maybe the Directorate of International Affairs, would be would be one of the organisations that would already be doing it because they have in the past. That's one of them. Another one which is really interesting, it goes right to the heart of it, it's actually the, um, uh, the Defence science and technology organization which is uh within the military or with it's within the um, minister of, it's, it's under the minister of defense anyway and it's based at um edinburgh air force base in south australia in adelaide and it also has had a history of various scientists and various technical specialists um you know, radio engineers and and and, and pilot pilot instructors and, and, and weapons developers and so on, taking an interest in UFOs and having classified correspondence between themselves and the Air Force and the Navy and so on. So that's another one. Mm. Um, the final one is, uh, which I can talk about later, is the um, the Air Force's 41 Wing. Where 41 Wing is responsible for, for, for aerial and aerospace surveillance, monitoring, detection of objects, planes and so on around, particularly around Australia's northern and northwestern and northeastern corridors. Um, and 41 Wing definitely, just by their very nature, they have to have an interest in UFOs. They have to be interested in, in, in you know, planes that have got their transponders turned off, uh, drug runners, um, the Australian missile, whatever. Mm. Um, so, so as far as... It, it, as far as if any of these organisations are actively studying UFOs, even if it's unfunded part time, or in especially for actual classified programs that we don't know about, mm. they will of course be very, very interested to see what this upcoming task force report actually says. They they may completely disagree with it. They may feel that they've already solved the UFO matter and there's nothing to it. They Australian Australian scientists and technical people, whether it's the CSIRO or I was saying before the DIO or the DST. You know, they they may uh, they may feel that they, that um, there's absolutely nothing that they can do about it. Too bad pilots see things, can't do anything about it. Mm. Uh, head in the sand like an ostrich. We <laughs> just don't know. Now, if as far as as far as what our power brokers like our you know ministers or or, or you know, it could be senators or maybe some of our um, government astronomers or CSIRO people, what they think about the report, I don't know. 
there will be discussions. There is absolutely no question that, that, that somewhere like Russell offices in Canberra or um, in you know the halls of Parliament that there will be discussions about it. There will be interests. It'll be in the Australian and the Age and so on. Uh, uh, yet to be seen. Mm. I, would, I suppose. Mm. I think it's it's very curious, isn't it? Because I've I've poured over um, many of the reports. Um, uh, from the National Archives of Australia, many of the thousands of, of reports that were reported to the uh, Royal Australian Air Force. Um, and I believe they stopped taking those reports um, from the public in 1994 and basically deferred anyone with a, a sighting or report to, to move on or some of the, I guess, the state-based agencies. So it, it's kind of... Uh, I, I'm very intrigued because surely... Uh, with with our ever increasing technological abilities, we would be still collecting a lot of um, interesting data, even though even though on the on the surface they've they've more or less said no, sorry, the the doors are closed and and we're not taking uh, you know we're not taking reports anymore. Years, decades pass, and all they get, mostly not all, but almost all of what they're getting is ranges from absolute garbage hoaxes and, and, and met people mentally ill and drunk right through to reasonably good reports, mm. right, but still technically anecdotal. You know, blurry photographs, truck drivers um, who have seen something, even if it's for five minutes, and absolutely swear black and blue. The point is, what happened was, from between 1954, you were, you were right about that date, 1994, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, actually, I was, I was the person who found the final rationale or what we would call um, the final kind of like plan and policy for actually cancelling the UFO, the Australian UFO Air Force program in 1994, the actual guy that wrote the rationale for the, for the, for the, um, for the Chief of Air to say, look, we've had enough of this, we don't want to take reports from the public anymore, um, this is the rationale, 10 pages, can you read it and sign it? The actual guy that wrote it was um, we, uh, was uh, was Group Captain Brett Bennington of the Royal Australian Air Force. Mm -hmm. He wrote a 10-page report for the Chief of Air saying, we don't, with the Air Force, it's too expensive, it's too embarrassing, it's too time-consuming, we don't want to do UFOs anymore, at least publicly. Mm -hmm. He wrote that and um, I got it out of the government. It was it took a long time, but what happened was was between 1954 and 1984, the Australian Air Force, the, the actual organisation within the Air Force, was the, was DAFI, which stand, which stood for um, Directorate of uh, Air Force Intelligence. Later, at the very end, it was called DAFIS, which is Directorate of Air Force Intelligence and Security. Um, so DAFI or slash DAFIS um, was begrudgingly taking UFO reports between 1954 or thereabouts and 1984, they were taking them from the public and, and military. They were basically taking them from anyone. Mm. Sometimes the report would come through, you know, observatories or the local police or whatever, but at the end of the day, the, the Air Force um, were the ones that would, would get these three... They would basically... You, the witness would have to fill out a three-page Air Force report and it would be studied... Um, at the nearest Air Force base, and that was up till 1984. Then they changed the policy. In 1984, they decided, right, from now on, we're only taking, or rather, we're only analysing reports that appear or do have a national security uh, implication. So that means that, you know, some lights in the sky in the middle of the desert, that's got no... That they would not even... If they got a report from that from... You know, like like a, a really mundane case. You know, I saw a flashing light in the sky. I don't know what it is. A bit worried. Whatever. They wouldn't touch it. Mm. Um, um, if they got a, re a report of a UFO that was right near a military base or um, something that it appeared to um, say a land and say start a fire, something like that, that they, they would invest. So so they would investigate those. But that's it. And then in 1994, they completely cancelled all of it. So even cases. That were that could have a national security implication. They um, they wouldn't accept them anymore. There was, however, one tiny little caveat that was really interesting. Not interesting from a UFO point of view, but interesting from a oh, a history point of view, I suppose. And what it was was this: the Air Force says we're no longer taking any UFO reports. If you want to report a UFO, go to the cops or go to you know a UFO buff organisation. You know, like the you know essentially a, a civilian UFO think tank group whatever mm -hmm. however 
any cases that may be of interest, for instance, let's say there was a case that was it looked like the witness says that they saw a UFO and it, it appeared to be on fire. Well, the Air Force, of course, would take an interest because it, it could be a plane in distress that's on fire that's going to crash or it has crashed. Or it might be a case where a satellite, you know, a Russian satellite has come back and landed in the desert or something like that, that where, where something might be of great interest to the government. Mm. But essentially, yeah, they... they they, they, they stopped, in 1994 really, they stopped taking any civilian reports. Now that leaves the door open for under the table classified, uh, more scientific, more data heavy reports and that's where our radar systems come in. I believe firmly that the Air Force said over the years from between, you know, 84 through 94 said basically we don't need any more anecdotal civilian even some military reports are basically garbage. We don't need hoaxes. We don't want to be receiving hoaxes anymore. We don't want to be getting phone calls from drunks. Mm. We don't want to be getting... Even good cases are no help to them at all. Mm. So they leant back and they said, we're going to rely on our aerospace radar systems like Jindalee Over the Horizon Radar Network or the three reporting and control unit radars or the air traffic control towers at Townsville Air Force Base and Catherine Air Force Base and Darwin Air Force Base and so on because raw data raw data like raw radar hits mm. you know raw radar hits especially when they might be backed up by a military pilot with infrared or a camera or infrared cameras or you know military eyes essentially that's far better than taking uh reports from civilians on the ground that's that's how it's basically worked yeah if you look at the history of it yep yep Wow. Um, look, um, I could I could um, talk to you and ask you questions for the next 12 hours, Paul, but we, we don't have that time. Um, um, I've really enjoyed our discussion, though, today. Um, thank you so much, and thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your insights um, with our audience. Um, I know you have a lot to say, and I, I, I've got um, a million more questions to ask you um, to discuss about um, the UFO phenomena, and we'd love to hear from you again. Would you like to come back on the show in the future? I would love to. I mean, I'll do. I'll, I'll do this. I mean, Australian audiences don't have a lot to go on. We we constantly look to the United States and to a lesser extent England and Canada. Um, you know, I, I can I can do this if I can get my daughters uh, Imogen and Vivian into bed on time. Um, we can do this <laughs> anytime you want. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much again, and. Um, yeah, I look forward to to um, to um, seeing what's in that report and discussing with you um, shortly thereafter. Thanks again, Paul. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Two minutes. Marshall Fast Eagle One Zero Seven Commencing State Seven Eight.